This uh, is going to deal uh, with the subject of a lecture series uh, next April, um, looking at explicitly the overall development of both architectural style and building methods um, in the English cathedral. And I think that clearly there are um, examples of specific cathedrals which will illustrate and inform that uh, development of the um, project uh, that uh, represented so much of a focus of activity in uh, England's medieval period. But I think the overall purpose of the uh, series will be to trace individual features that develop over time, um, and particularly uh, looking at the transition from the Anglo-Norman style through to uh, the Gothic style, um, the Gothic style taking um, its own very distinctive path um, in England. The Anglo-Norman architecture, um, taking that to distinguish such architecture from the architecture of Normandy itself, um, could be said to have actually started before the conquest. Um, Edward the Confessor brought um, Abbot Robert of Junierge uh, in Normandy over to England. Um, Robert was to become Bishop of London and then Bishop of Canterbury, Archbishop of Canterbury. And one of the features which, of course, was uh, happening at the time that he was um, supporting Edward the Confessor's court was the construction of uh, the Westminster Abbey. Edward the Confessor's church um, was uh, created essentially in an outright Norman style and was completed um, at the end of 1065, which of course is a particular date to be conjured with and its activities during the following year uh, were quite complicated winding up with a coronation at the end of that year. The format, I think, of the church is extremely difficult to um, establish on the basis that Henry III uh, was good enough to rebuild entirely in a, in a new Gothic style um, in uh, the 1200s completely um, obscuring, uh, demolishing and obscuring Edward the Confessor's church. But you know, if Abbot Robert came from Normandy and was in charge to a large extent of the church under Edward the Confessor, having a look at this abbey church that survives at Jumierge, uh, after all his own abbey, might inform us to some extent uh, of the uh, format uh, of Westminster. You can see very prominent twin towers at the west end of the church. You can see the format of the nave here, um, very bulky masonry, typical of the Norman uh, project, alternating piers and round bulky columns, and altogether uh, something fully typical of the Romanesque style uh, which had developed across Europe, and which in effect was what, what was the style which the uh, Norman uh, administration brought across to England and established for the great building project um, of the English cathedrals. If we look across at one of the um, elevations of this surviving nave, it's interesting to see that it's fundamentally a three-storey affair. And this becomes characteristic of virtually all the medieval uh, cathedrals and associated with it, although, of course, we lack the direct evidence of this, as you can see from the view of the sky at the top, uh, is the notion that this would have been topped with a timber roof structure. And if we look at just um, a simple drawing 
um, of the format in a moment. Um, what we can see, I think, is that uh, this three-storey structure provides height, provides uh, grandeur, um, provides light in the sense that the windows in the upper part of the format, uh, the clear story or clerestory windows, bring light down into the central uh, part of a church structure of this kind. And there's also a question of status. It was cathedrals that demanded a um, structure of this kind, or great abbey churches. Now, amongst the most um, advanced early work of the post-conquest period was clearly going to be uh, a rebuilding of Canterbury Cathedral. William Normandy brought um, Lanfranc, um, who was abbot at uh, William of Normandy's foundation of Saint Etienne in Caen, um, and he became Archbishop of Canterbury from 1070. And what we see there is uh, the development of a new church, which once again um, we can see in parallel with many of the Norman churches of this period, went uh, straight over the top of the pre-existing Saxon church. Choosing a very simplified sort of plan, uh, this is what we believe uh, the format of the uh, Canterbury Cathedral uh, created under Lanfranc would have been. You can see that at the eastern end uh, we have uh, the presence of the high altar and its uh, position uh, indicated by the semicircular form of an apse and also four further apsed chapels on either side. Uh, what the plan doesn't explicitly reveal, but which appear to have been in place, a crossing tower, in other words, at the, at the interchange point between the line of the nave and the transepts, and also a pair of towers at the western end of the church. One of the features then that I think it looks likely that this uh, corresponded with uh, is the church of Saint Etienne itself in Col. Another case potentially of an individual bringing an architectural style and, and design format with him. The situation uh, that uh, developed uh, saw larger Anglo-Norman churches built over their Saxon uh, sites uh, as cathedral uh, foundations um, in a remarkable um, period of building. If one looks across the medieval period at the extent to which building was going on in the same uh, decade, rather than spread out over time, then around and about the year 1090 or 1100 would represent the peak. That was when there were more projects on, on cathedrals going on than there had ever been or had yet to come in subsequent time. And the resources to, to provide for all of this building remains an exceptionally impressive um, affair. And part of the style was also um, relevant, I think, to the politics, in the sense that the uh, churches were built in a very um, heavy form of masonry construction. Stone had been a format uh, very much uh, using good local materials in Normandy, and some of that, uh, stone from Caen, for example, was even brought across for some of the projects Canterbury included. But by the 1090s, um, this church at Canterbury had been put somewhat in the shade by work on other churches, we'll touch on Winchester, uh, that had been uh, happening uh, at that time. And what we see is a development of the uh, church structure uh, by 
Archbishop Anselm. And what he seeks to do is to preserve uh, the nave of the church. So if we just look at the uh, structure here, he preserves this part of the Lanfranc Cathedral, but he then develops this eastern portion of the church to some three times its, its pre-existing length. And we can see that here. So here we have the crossing uh, point uh, with the nave going away uh, to the west. And here we see the extent of this piece of work which was carried out by uh, the masons working uh, in Anselm's time. And I, I think you can see here from the dotted line uh, the position of the pre-existing eastern end of Canterbury from Lanfranc's time. And it was so substantial uh, that even today, this is the profile of the cathedral as it is today, uh, extended very little uh, on the ambitious Romanesque project uh, that Ansel uh, produced. There is actually um, plenty of um, surviving uh, evidence, uh, despite later Gothic work, uh, of what had been created uh, by uh, Lanf Lanfranc and then by Ansel, in particular Ansel's work. If we look at this combination of eastern transept and radiating chapel, the notion of having chapels uh, grouped around the apse of the eastern end, you can see these if we look here at the surviving structure of the eastern transept and here at the structure of the south version uh, of the radiating chapel. Yes, for sure, um, a Gothic window has been inserted at a later date. But if we look more carefully, you can see round arches, you can see uh, the great Romanesque love of blind arcading using round arches as the format. And I think you'll see that here uh, we've got an example of intersecting blind arcading, uh, which is quite uh, intriguing because it can give the impression of the pointed arch. And if we look here in a bit more detail uh, at uh, the east wall of the northeast uh, transept, you can see the apse form here accommodating chapels uh, on the interior eastern wall. But if you look at the profile of this um, intersecting uh, blind arcading, you'll see that these are actually semicircular arches, but they are interlaced in such a way that they produce an apparent pointed arch. But the overall style here, of course, is firmly Romanesque, and a, and a, a good deal of development has gone on between the 1070s of Lanfranc and the 1090s uh, of Ansel. Finally, there were towers incorporated in this eastern section of the church, um, and this is an example of the surviving uh, Romanesque tower uh, at the southeast uh, corner. And again, you can see magnificent uh, decorative work uh, in the Romanesque style, um, arcading again, and altogether um, a really uh, expensive piece of work carried out in stone. Now, let's take um, us through this uh, quick view of the subject today. Um, the theme I want to bring out is the question of how you create uh, the high central roof structure of these great cathedrals. The creation of the high vault and the close association uh, between the perception of a medieval cathedral and the stone rib vaulting, uh, one of the glories of the, of the Gothic period. Starting out with the um, massive project that was tackled not too long after Canterbury, um, we look at uh, the structure of uh, Winchester. Um, this, the West Front, is uh, visibly uh, a Gothic structure, um, one of the many uh, conversions from Romanesque to Gothic that occurred in our cathedral churches. But if we look 
at uh, some of the earlier work that still survives. For example, uh, the transepts of Winchester, we can see the um, existing uh, format preserved of the Romanesque uh, style of building. The round arches of the aisle structure, tiny but nonetheless round arched windows providing light for the gallery, and again somewhat smaller round arched windows in the clear story which have been subsequently converted into the Gothic style with window tracery. But the sheer power and bulk of this architecture is reflected internally. This is inside that same north transept. And once again, um, we don't seem to be a million miles away from some of the feel of Jumiège in the sense that we have these bulky uh, piers and we have uh, the uh, compound structure applying a lot of shafts to a pier structure represented as well. The masonry is quite brutal really, quite a lot of hard edges, quite a lot of relatively heavy duty feel uh, to the structure concerned. What I think is notable um, is that the roof structure here is in timber. We then see um, the development at Ely. The work was going on in uh, Winchester from uh, 1079 under Bishop Walkley, um, but in 1082, Walklin's prior was appointed um, abbot at Ely, uh, a Benedictine community, with the task of creating a very large abbey church. And this was to become, in fairly short uh, succession, in 1109, a cathedral. And there were very strong political reasons for building a very dominant um, structure expressing real commitment, real political power uh, in the Fenland, uh, which had not been the easiest part of William of Normandy's uh, domain in the early years. Um, the feature, I think, that uh, uh, gives one a great deal of hope is that uh, Simeon, who was the um, man appointed as uh, abbot, promoted from being prior of Winchester, was actually Walkling's brother, but at the time he was aged 89. And he took the project forward, um, and he finally died in 1093 at the age of 100. Um, so there's always scope, <laughs> even for major projects. And this is the nave of uh, Ely, which is a, a full survival of the project uh, that he uh, commissioned. Uh, you can see that we've got, uh, again, this grandeur represented by three uh, levels uh, in the structure on either side, the story above. And what we can also see um, is that this is all uh, capped by a timber roof structure. Um, here we actually have a decorative scheme of the 19th century, uh, but that doesn't in any way uh, detract from the point that the uh, structure at that level is fundamentally timber. And I think you could see a little bit more detail of the way that that works. Um, and you can see how uh, the 19th century um, designers may just have had some awareness of the Sistine Chapel, it's hard to tell. Um, a bit more evidence is to be had by looking at the Great Abbey Church uh, of St Peter uh, aptly at Peterborough. Uh, and here you've got surviving uh, timber roof structure over the nave. Um, and here the, the roof structure in its design format uh, dates from the 1200s. So this is an absolutely magnificent example surviving uh, of how the upper part of the structure 
would have, would have been seen in many of the other churches, the other cathedral churches of England. But I want to move on to Durham. And here, I think it's notable that uh, uh, the appointment of Bishop uh, at Durham uh, went to William of St. Calais from 1083. And he was a very powerful character on this um, border post, as it were, uh, in the northeast of England. But it wasn't until 1093, a whole decade, before serious work started on the uh, cathedral church at Durham. And in fact, there was a chapel established in uh, Durham Castle, the residence of the bishop, uh, long before the actual cathedral uh, construction uh, commenced. And this lateness of start, a project starting in 1093 and running through to around about 1133, was, I think, associated with the use of some new ideas. And Durham, however much it appears to be up in the sort of top left-hand corner of Europe and a bit out of the way, was revolutionary. This is the um, aisle of the north side of the choir. And what you can see is the construction of a rib vault. Um, probably um, before 1096, um, and if that is the case, it makes that the earliest um, rib type vault um, in Britain, and very probably anywhere. And the the format is one of um, elegance and of lightness, because unlike um, the barrel vault available from Roman times, which is a series of stone blocks uh, creating a semicircular arch over a space, here the technique is to build these arches that represent the ribs first, and then use the lightest possible stone in the uh, pockets referred to as the web, uh, the opportunity then to use very little um, bulky uh, material there. In fact, some uh, parts of Europe see the use of volcanic stone, with a lot of trapped air in the stonework, uh, in order to keep the, the, the loading quite light. But of course, the other great thing, which is the aesthetic aspect in, in England, that we, we should look at of the introduction of rib vaulting, is that the rib structure itself can be extremely elegant. And what we see then is the development of the nave of the church. And here you can see um, a development uh, that uh, was going on um, through until around 1120 of the structure itself. And you can see that now the courage has been taken to use this stone rib vault system over the main space and therefore uh, for the high vault. And it's based upon the notion of using uh, diagonal ribs. And these diagonals are fundamentally still uh, semicircular in the format, crossing over from the central point. Uh, but what's really intriguing is that the ones that go directly across the space, the transverse ribs, are actually pointed arches. And I don't think um, the conclusion should be drawn that this means that this is Gothic architecture. This was a purely practical response to the need to keep the level of the centre part of the roof structure at the same height. And if you take advantage of the opportunity to extend upwards, if you use, use a pointed arch, you can achieve that. If this was a semicircular arch, by definition not being of the same length as the diagonals, it would have by, by necessity uh, come down to a lower height in the center. So here we see um, a combination of uh, rib vaulting and pointed arches, and yet 
we can still quite confidently say that this is a Romanesque, i.e. an Anglo-Norman style church. Everything else about it uh, fits in into that pattern. The direct view up into this um, vault uh, shows us in the centre uh, the transverse arch, uh, which is a pointed form, and you can then see that on either side uh, the, the pattern is laid out over double bays. So you have a bay which represents the space between two supporting piers here, and you can see that uh, four diagonal ribs are used on either side above two bays. So having dismissed the idea that this is Gothic because it's got some Gothic features, where does Gothic come in? Well, one of the earliest um, true Gothic examples of work uh, was at uh, Canterbury. And this is where we come back to this uh, drawing which shows the development of the uh, eastern portion of Canterbury Cathedral. And the key event which was the precursor to this uh, was the murder of Becket in 1170. And in the same sort of time, a serious fire in Anselm's uh, eastern arm of the church. Um, by 1173, uh, Thomas uh, Becket had been canonised and there was an impetus on the part of the monastic community, Benedictine community at uh, Canterbury, to have a fitting shrine site for the saint. And the layout here extends the previous Anselm uh, project uh, to create uh, what is now termed the Trinity Chapel, which was a shrine chapel for the body of uh, Thomas, and to add on at the end um, a structure called the Corona, uh, which was the place uh, for the accommodation of his head reliquary. It's not unusual that saints find themselves in more than one piece, shall we put it that way. And this is the structure that we see today. This is the region of the Shrine Chapel. And this is the separate uh, structure of the corona. The style here um, is where we see direct influence from France. In the 1140s, um, the Abbey Church of Saint-Denis, burial site for the French monarchy, had seen a radically new style of architecture applied to the reconstruction of its choir. And in 1144, uh, the consecration uh, ceremony uh, had many of the key people in the church around Europe present. Um, the abbot at Saint-Denis was effectively the principal advisor to the then king, and the clergy must have gone back to their own uh, dioceses uh, in other countries and other parts of France uh, feeling that they'd seen the future. And I think one of the um, striking parts of the new formula is the adoption of the rib vault as a key part of the Gothic style. Um, and therefore we tend subsequently to associate the two together. You can see that uh, what um, happens when we move to Canterbury is an adaption of the uh, Saint-Denis model. Um, and we have an identified master mason um, on the strength of the work of the monk Gervais in the Benedictine community who recorded the events of this time, William of Sons. So Sons was a cathedral which was reconstructed in the new style, inspired by Saint-Denis, um, and by the 1170s, uh, the start of this project at Canterbury, uh, there was 
every scope uh, to bring this idea, this style across and use it um, in the new project. Um, the choir of the uh, church, if I go back to this diagram for a moment, um, the existing choir in this region here was the first phase of the project and was reconstructed in the new format and then the, the additional shrine chapel and corona were added uh, later. So the first part of that was uh, happening from 1175 and the shrine chapel and corona from the 1180s. The specific um, of the structure of the vaulting um, you can see here um, the pointed format of the transverse arches you can see the crossover of the diagonal ribs if we go a little closer you can see uh, that we have um, the intersection of diagonals and the use of transverse ribs in such a way that in many cases uh, the space is divided into six pockets of webbing and this was a format which could be closely associated with much of the early Gothic work in France uh, that we've touched upon. Partial reconstruction of English Romanesque cathedrals followed on using the Gothic style. So, for example, uh, the East Arm, the choir of a Romanesque church, might be demolished and replaced with a Gothic um, replacement, but sitting attached to a surviving Romanesque nave. But there is one outstanding example which doesn't fit that uh, format. At Salisbury, a totally new site was uh, established from uh, around about 1220, and a consistent style of Gothic was applied throughout the entire building. In common with any other project uh, of this time that really started with a fresh uh, uh, opportunity uh, to build, the project was carried out from east to west, giving the earliest possible um, space for worship to take place. Um, and the west front was finally tackled in the early 1250s. The only parts uh, that uh, are of significance uh, of later date were in fact the extended height of the tower and the completion of the existing spire uh, which came in the period between uh, 1300 and the 1320s. But what we see is remarkable. Um, from 1200 the work to create this chapel at the eastern end of Salisbury is underway and what it represents is um, a swing from the later part of the um, 1100s where Anglo-Norman style building is still happening around England with its bulk to a slenderness that is almost unbelievably at contrast and with rib vaulting forming a key part. And then if we look at the nave uh, construction here from roughly 1246. Um, you can see once again uh, a high vault at the centre uh, created uh, with the rib vault uh, approach but I think what is particularly notable is that it represents uh, simplicity and the arrangement if we look at uh, directly up at it uh, places an intersecting pair of diagonals in each bay. So the bay is defined here by the support piers that uh, would reach the pavement of the, of the nave and transverse arch uh, format on either side. So what this represents is a section of webbing which is in four parts uh, and this is the format uh, adopted as in France early Gothic gives way to high Gothic. So this is a format of the high vault, which will be very familiar in many of the French cathedrals. And it's also, of course, <coughs> the, the point in time when English architecture finds its way on a separate path 
with the development of what we now refer to as the early English style. But if I stick for a moment with this, with this question of rib vaults and, uh, and the high vault structure, um, Lincoln is a fascinating place. The development of the <coughs> pre-existing um, Anglo-Norman cathedral constructed under Bishop Remigius saw a building constructed between 1072 and uh, 1092, uh, but then a massive earthquake in 1185 <coughs> removed much of the structure, save for uh, parts of the West Block, which survives today. And you can see round arches and uh, identifiably Romanesque arcading in that structure. Within the cathedral, there are three different phases of introduction of the Gothic style, making it a um, particularly good place to look at the root vault and its format. Um, firstly, um, in the period of uh, the uh, Archbishop Hugh of Avalon, the choir was reconstructed from 1192. And then we see the development of the nave, which you can see here. And finally, on the eastern end of the uh, choir, a further uh, space was developed, which is known as the Angel Choir. And it effectively became a shrine site uh, for Hugh himself, uh, who was canonised and became Saint Hugh of Lincoln. The vault directly above this space in the choir is a sight to behold. Here we've moved from uh, the simple uh, variant, with the simple, simple pair of diagonals, uh, to an asymmetric form <coughs> that, in, that, it, that features the idea of adding a third rib. In other words, you've got a transverse, you've got the diagonal rib, and then we've got a third rib, which introduces the term tiesalon. Uh, that is the extra rib. And the idea of adding to these ribs uh, becomes the concept of a tiesalon vault. The affectionate uh, title um, in many of the writings about this particular vault is the crazy vault. And there seems to be no evidence that this particular um, form of vault was ever adopted anywhere else subsequently. The nave, <coughs> which was the second part of the project, um, involved magnificent development of a much more complicated um, project uh, of the um, high vault. Uh, again using extra ribs, but doing so in an entirely symmetrical pattern. <clears throat> and this is the great glory of the development, as you can see here, uh, of the uh, English uh, Tiersaron uh, rib vault, uh, by comparison with what I think we must now regard as perhaps an experimental phase uh, in St. Hugh's choir. <coughs> Um, what we're looking into from the choir is down to the eastern end of Lincoln and the development from 1255 of the Angel Choir. And once again, this is a very rich, um, high, highly carved, um, decorated uh, piece of work. And you, you can see again that it's using uh, this uh, Tiesoron form of vaulting. I think the thing to comment on is, of course, that <coughs> vault heights here are not particularly different from that of Salisbury, where it's perfectly satisfactory to have a simple quadripartite um, vault format. This is about um, the fascination with the decorative contribution of adding extra ribs. And when we move to <coughs> Exeter, we're into the uh, period of architecture that we now 
refer to as the English decorated style, uh, which involves, for example, <coughs> an extensive use of window tracery, uh, not a feature in general of the early English style, and varied tracery at that. You can see in the nave here that various patterns are being established. And if we looked at the <coughs> format of the choir, um, you can see that uh, the idea of having extra ribs has taken off to a yet further stage. Um, and what we can see is uh, a, a development uh, which involves a movement upwards in numbers. And here, for each of the springing points, in other words, the place where the rib vault structure is supported by the wall, the springing point, has 15 uh, forms. One is the transverse rib, um, and then there are a further 14 uh, diagonal ribs. York Minster um, and York Cathedral, um, on the same thing, um, saw reconstruction in the Gothic style. Um, its transepts are good representatives of the early English. Uh, its west uh, arm uh, is a good representation of the nave. Uh, the decorated style in its east and a representation today of the perpendicular style, the last of those formats. And here we're in the nave looking towards the west and what I think you can see um, above is uh, the addition of short ribs um, making up a more complicated pattern. These are called leurns um, and then the leurn rib uh, vault becomes a yet more complicated um, available variant. The window tracery is magnificent and this is the style called flowing uh, tracery. Perpendicular style um, arose just before the Black Death and became dominant after the Black Death in 1348. Uh, in Gloucester work had been going on from the 1330s and you can see the east window of the Abbey Church of Gloucester, uh, which became a cathedral after the Reformation. And I think you can see also some of the format um, of the perpendicular style, the sense of using uh, a lot of panels which have a vertical emphasis. But just have a peek for a moment at the roof structure. Um, here the idea of replicating ribs has got a bit out of hand. <laughs> and also, um, it's very uh, effective if you can place a carved vault boss at the intersection of ribs. The more ribs you have, the more vault bosses you have. And this becomes a, a, a magnificent feature. And here we've seen, um, over a period of time, we're looking here at work uh, going on between the 1330s, 1360s and 70s in Gloucester, uh, you've got something which is, is worlds away from what French architecture has been doing. So if we then look um, at that structure, uh, you can see uh, the format of the uh, vaulting. And then if we return to York, um, the creation of perpendicular style work uh, to produce the east end of the uh, cathedral, again uses uh, the Leon style of vault. And the feature which I think is perhaps most spectacular uh, is the development of the specifically English idea of a large single window but subdivided with magnificent stone tracery. And that stone tracery here in the <coughs> perpendicular as opposed to the decorated um, style. And one of the features I think that uh, uh, York is um, justly proud of um, is the scale of the work on this particular window. Um, larger than a tennis court, seems to appear in York's guide to its cathedral, and indeed it is, 
and the work that was uh, carried out um, around about 1405 um, set out um, a program adopting uh, the various spaces which the perpendicular style of tracery, stone tracery, provides in terms of this major piece of uh, stained glass work. I'll pause there. Um, the thinking, I, th I think, runs through chronologically, and you can see the sort of approach that I'm taking, pick out examples from these wonderful buildings to illustrate how something is developed, and also how the practical methods of building that have gone along with it. But you can see that it's not all about meeting the practical needs of building. Quite a bit of it is purely uh, aesthetic. So we've got perhaps a few moments for any um, queries, questions, or comments that you might have, and I'd certainly welcome those. Yes? I was just wondering about the structural mechanics of these things. Obviously, people, if they best looked in from the back to see how it's working, presumably they were getting more confident about getting, let's say, thinner, thinner structures and thinner rims or something like that, so they had more in. Yes. Um, this period didn't see suitable calculations for forces available. Um, the designers were, were um, gifted at geometry, um, but they effectively learned by a process of continuous experimentation. And one particular feature was that uh, the Norman architecture had a massive bulk that was not strictly necessary, and they found that step by step they could reduce to a thinner and thinner structure. Um, ending up with sometimes things which are made in stone but look breathtaking. Yes? Yeah, my question is to that really. You've shown us ones that survived, but presumably quite a lot of them did collapse. There were, there were quite a few um, collapses. Um, I think what is perhaps a good example to, to point to is uh, the cathedral at Ely, which we touched on. Um, it's the way in which uh, a response to adversity um, was uh, often uh, elicited. And at Ely, the central crossing tower collapsed, probably due to the ground conditions under it, um, and the, the format of Ely's octagon stemmed directly from seeking a, a, a means of dealing with that particular problem. So um, the, the failures were, were ploughed back, as it were, into the development of new projects and new ideas for, for later, later on. But an extremely expensive business just to... I mean, I just wonder Well, I think they had a fairly high success rate. I, they had failures, and some were natural um, interventions, um, but um, they poured enormous uh, proportions of the available resources that the country had into these projects in a way which suggested huge commitment to them. So I think that was a that was a factor uh, in, in terms of the uh, the dominant way in which uh, this architecture was uh, was a focal point. I mean, for the ordinary citizen of the medieval period, walking into one of these high vaulted spaces must have been extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. Yes? Well, we're pretty certain that uh, uh, the rib vaulting, for example, uh, was handled by producing a timber frame which had the shape of the vault, laying the stonework on that frame until, with all the stones in place, the arch, the arch of each rib uh, would su support itself. Uh, but to be doing that with the resources that they had and at the heights they were working was undoubtedly... Well, yes, yes. And uh, not exactly 21st century health and safety standards either, I, I guess. One final question, if I may. Yes? Yes. 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 Yes.
Yes, I think um, the sad thing is that many of the great and brilliant designers and senior masons simply failed to have their names recorded. Uh, but where there is information, it does look, and increasingly so as the medieval period worked its way through, that the, the top structure, if you like, the most senior masons and the master masons did indeed move around, uh, developing their expertise as, as they did so. Okay, I'd better um, allow for the uh, next session. So thank you for your attention. Um, right, uh, that's just to summarize um, where the uh, lecture series will take place, which is in here, um, and from the 21st of April, uh, next year over six weeks.